Hi, everybody. My name is Sonia. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word? And today's reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 41. So Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 41. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has heard out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. May God bless the reading of his word, and you can be seated. Amen. Okay. Well, I want to, uh, sometimes I like to keep us abreast of uh, that which is happening with people and places around us. If you don't know, last week was World Mission Sunday, um, which is honestly something more in the Catholic tradition, but it's meant to always remind uh, the church at large uh, that we exist for the nations. Um, So that was last Sunday. And then this um, Sunday, and these next few days really will mark the season of like Diwali. Um, and so when I think of the nations, that actually has a particular personal connection to me uh, coming from a Hindu background, Diwali being the festival of lights. And so if you have any kind of Indian communities in your neighborhoods or, or Hindu uh, families, uh, this week you might see little candles with lights set up uh, around their house as they celebrate the festival of lights, which in many ways is similar to Hanukkah in that it's commemorating a story of light over darkness, victory over evil. Um, and so keep, um, keep kind of head on a swivel and even look for opportunities to be able to kind of connect the dots and hear people's stories and then maybe connect the dots on what it looks like for our festival of lights, uh, light over darkness, victory over evil. As Sonia just read, um, this Jesus who God has raised Uh, the Holy Spirit who God has promised and poured out uh, for the forgiveness of sins, for those who believe and were baptized. Some people have gotten baptized this year. Um, And for everyone that the Lord calls from the four corners of the earth. Um, And we bear witness of that, right? We bear witness of all of these things that God is doing, the, the great light over darkness, victory over evil narrative that he has been telling since the beginning of history. Uh, We bear witness with that. And last week we talked about how that requires that we operate with a kind of mindset, right? We talked about the difference between what we were calling a scarcity mindset and a multiplication mindset, right? The multiplication mindset is a mindset that believes ultimately that we're headed in an optimistic direction, that that the Spirit of God is the wind at our backs propelling us in the direction of the new covenant. And yes, from time to time we will experience pain, But the fundamental reality in where we are right now is not pain, it's not a downward direction, because if you believe that, you will live a life of scarcity. You will live a life of risk aversion. You'll always be wondering what could go wrong. And instead, because of the the Jesus that God has raised and the Holy Spirit that he has promised and poured out, uh, we believe in this. And so we do adopt a multiplication mindset. And so what that looks like for us is, Um, A core virtue, three of our core virtues, the one that we focused on last week was this third one at the bottom, that we want to uphold the tension of health and growth. Not either or, 
And it's one of the things I said last week, that, that our core virtues, they're values that arise out of the character and nature of our God. And our God is attention, right? He's not either one or more than one. He's both. Uh, he's unity and he's diversity. He's both. And so if this world is reflecting his character, his nature, his purposes, we should experience the world as tensions, as both ands, not necessarily either ors. And so we want to know what it looks like for us to be a community that is shaped by health and growth, right? That virtue. Um, and we, we kind of fleshed it out in a couple of different ways, faithful and fruitful. And last week, Matt asked a question that frankly ruined my sermon calendar because this week was supposed to be about our second uh, core virtue of openness and critique. But Matt asked the question, like, what does it look like for us to be fruitful? What does fruitfulness look like? Is it, is it qualitative or is it quantitative? Or is that another either or? Is it both? And I made the argument last week from the parable of the talents that it is both. Okay, what does that mean for us? And so some of those questions uh, prompted me to kind of table the sermon calendar at least for a week and to dig a little bit more on this particular virtue, health and growth, this particular mindset, multiplication. How does this look for us? And maybe to ask us, how has this looked for us? How is this looking for us? And today, in Acts chapter 2, what Luke, the author of uh, the book of Acts, has for us, and the spirit behind him is um, that what this mindset, what that virtue looks like for us is that we would share a risky way of life that actually moves us closer to safety. Right? Nikki did this face. She did like, she's like, wait, what? Uh, uh, it's causing us to sustain a way of life that is a risky way of life but one that actually moves us towards safety, a kind of safety. Um, let's pray with me now, and let's see what the Lord has for us, if he can clarify that contradiction, so to speak, risky way of life that moves us towards safety. Pray with me. Um, Father, this is a prayer of invitation. Um, we not only invite your presence, as always, to open up our eyes, um, but we invite ourselves to be reflective and to consider where it is that we haven't been this, but also to, to, to reflect on where it is that we have been this and are being this, Lord. And so I just pray that, yes, that there's always the challenge of Scripture, but there's also great encouragement that comes today, Lord, uh, to know that, that health and growth is not something just far away from us that we need to grow up into. It's always that, but it is also something we are growing in. And so would your spirit please, yes, challenge, but also encourage in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Um, let me locate today's passage, which really, um, Sonia read the precursor. We're actually going to be in Acts 2, 42 to 47. All right, a couple of verses there. Uh, to do that, I want to kind of chronicle what's been happening in the book of Acts real quickly at this time. And it is, has been a story of, of, of health and growth. It has been a story of faithfulness and fruitfulness and multiplication to say the least. And it's been not just like a thing that's happened. God has been really um, kind of tying all of history together in the early part of the book of Acts. And so you guys might be familiar with these scenes. On the right, God is sending, uh, you know, in Acts chapter 2, there's this event called Pentecost. Uh, 50 days after the resurrection, um, in which God is sending, uh, as it were, his spirit upon his early church, and they appear, the spirit comes as like tongues of flame, uh, a little flames above their head that imparts to them tongues, and the tongues of the nations, for the purposes of gathering all the peoples of the earth back to the true worship of God. Right? And that is not just like, ooh, let me do this magic show that freaks people out. Uh, it's meant to kind of tie up a loose end that's been there since the Tower of Babel, in which there was tongues given as a means of dividing all the nations of the, wor of the world against God. 
And so what's happening in Acts chapter 2 is a reversal of the Tower of Babel. It's regathering the nations in true worship. So that's one aspect in which there is faithful and fruitful multiplication happening in the early church. And not just that, there's another storyline that's getting tied uh, together in the early part of the book of Acts. In this chapter, chapter 2, it's, it has to do with the law. And so the law was initially given to Israel here on the left to form them as a people, as a distinct people. And much like happens with us, happens with them, that as soon as the law is given, in some sense, the law is broken. And that's what you see here on the left is the day the law was given, the people gets impatient. I was just talking to a bunch of people out there about my impatience in certain areas. Um, So impatience is sitting well with me. But the people got impatient. They were waiting for God. And so the law they were given, primarily the law about not to make idols and graven images, they're like, hmm, uh, we don't have much else to do. So let's throw uh, a little bit of a, you know, let's go Jersey Shore. <laughs> and, you know, they don't have, it's not GTL, it's not DTA, it's, it's, well, it might be actually. Um, they have their own version of what it looks like for them to be down at Seaside, except they're doing it on Sinai. They get the law and it says 3,000 died on the day that the law was given. The problem was the law was given, but there was no spirit. There was no place for the law to land on. In the early part of the book of Acts, the gospel is preached. Jesus' name is proclaimed. The spirit is given. And don't you know what happens in the book of Acts? It says, in that day, 3,000 came to life. And it's not so much as important to be like, was it actually 3,000? It's more important to know that what God is doing is he's, he's, he's picking on his, his reader's biblical imagination and saying, hey, you remember this early thing that happened, the reversal of that is now happening. In the story in Jesus of his early church, that old story of death is now being unwound into this story of new life. And so a people that were faithless and fruitless are now being reconstituted in a faithful and fruitful way. And so that's what's the precursor to today's passage in verses 42 to 47. And you might be thinking, that's great. That's great for them. But I don't think that we're necessarily going to experience Pentecost in this way. And I don't necessarily think that we're going to, some, one of us is going to go open air preaching in the Brunswicks or in Somerset or Highland Park or touch it, where have it, and then 3,000 people in mass are going to be are going to receive the Lord, be baptized, and saved. We wish, right? And so maybe then the conversation about multiplication, health, and growth just kind of dies, or becomes really irrelevant. It was descriptive of them, but it's not prescriptive of us. It describes what happened then, but it really isn't saying anything about what we're supposed to look like. And that's where I think verses 42 to 47 come uh, and speak to us and give us a different vision of what health, growth, multiplication looks like. Starting in verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves. Before I go on any further, let me just say that this is an important starting point. That, That the people who saw all of these early things happening their response was, wasn't, how can we make more stuff like this happen? Sometimes that does happen. But their response is really, really different. It's really kind of like homey. It's really kind of earthy. Um, It's not as sensationalist as something like that, which may feel far from us. It's actually something that we have more access to. And their response, first and foremost, is, and they devoted themselves to. And really, the language you should be hearing there is not really, it's they were continually devoting themselves to. I think the best rendering there is probably they were readying themselves. And so the question is, readying how? And for what? What were they readying themselves for? And at this point, what I want us to do in these next couple of verses is I want to ask us a little bit to enter into our own stories. Um our past, um, and maybe not too distant past, 
in Christian communities. I want us to be able to reconnect, because you're going to hear some things in these next few verses that are going to reconnect with things that were once familiar to you. And not just familiar to you, they may have even been fond. They may have even been a place of like familiarity and fondness for you, a place that you loved to be at one time, but have kind of departed from. And I, w- I want to uh, ask you guys and invite you guys, I pray a prayer of invitation, I want to invite you guys um, to allow yourself to go there. Because someone said something interesting to me this week um, at a, a CG, which you'll hear more about in a little bit. But they said, you know, talking about, like, I feel like we're in, we're now in, like, I lived in that generation where it's like there was before 9-11 and then there was after 9-11, and it's a different world. And I feel like my kids are growing up in the before pandemic and after pandemic world. Um, and there's this language of, like, all right, well, You know, after we came back from the pandemic, and someone said this week, it's like, we never came back. And it's really similar to how they talk about themes like exile in Scripture, where it's like Israel is back in the land, and yet they're still in exile in another sense. and, and, And this has been their history, right? Like, they left Egypt, but Egypt didn't leave them. And so in some sense, they said to me, like, we came back, but we really didn't come back. And initially, I thought about that, and I said, yeah, you're right. And then I kept thinking about that, and I said, I'm not so sure. Because I think there's something in us that says, like, we came back worse. And I understand that. But I, I, I wonder if there's another way we can also look at this, which is maybe we came back better prepared and readied for what God has for us. We just haven't connected all the dots and gone far enough in some sense. And so I want us to be open to reconnecting to something familiar, um, uh, maybe considering whether or not we've come back, but also being open to the fact that we're not worse off than we were. We might be in some sense closer to where we need to be than we realize. So let me make that argument in these next few verses, because what it's going to show us is what does it look like for this early community that's responding to all of this growth, qualitative and quantitative, all the nations of the world, all of these numbers, what does it look like for them to sustain health and growth? So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Notice in verse 2. Right? Some of us, uh, that was a real fond place at an earlier point of our Christian journey. I was talking with... um, I've talked at length with my wife about this. I've talked with Marty and Claire about this. We became Christians in a church that really uh, had a high primacy for like going through the Bible, like almost word by word. They would call it verse by verse. And there was like such a, uh, I remember once I lost my Bible for a week and I was a mess. I was a mess. And maybe that wasn't a good thing, but it did say something of how highly I viewed the voice, of, uh, the voice of God through Scripture in my life then. And I think now, I think we still in some sense have a high regard for gospel. Like, I think we all believe that the gospel is important. But I think if, if we're honest with ourselves, we probably have done a, a demoting of Scripture. Or what Scripture, or the place that it has in our lives, or the authority it might have in our lives. Um, the value. So again, we wouldn't say that about the gospel because that means something far scarier. But we might say uh, that we're, we're still devoted to the gospel in some sense, but I don't know if we would say that we're devoted to the apostles' teaching, to scripture, and definitely not in the way we used to be. And maybe that's not a bad thing. But it's actually a point of reflection. Because I think at one time, scripture was a treasure for us. And then as you get like acquainted with it, it goes from treasure to becomes a, a tool. It's a tool. I'm learning how to use this. I'm learning how to wield this. And then the, you, you, it morphs, either in your hands or the hands of somewhere else, where it goes from being a treasure and a tool to a weapon. And it's a weapon that, that could land on you. It's a weapon that you can see land on others. 
And I think the hardest part is when you realize that it was once a tool in your hand and then it became a weapon in your hand. And you I don't want to be that anymore. And then it just, and then it becomes this like thing that you get, you kind of hide from, or maybe at most you hover around. But it's not the, 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 the place, it's not, it's not home like it used to be. But, but we can't live without content in our lives. Like we're, we're, we're kind of content laden as a culture. And so we still want a voice in our lives. And so we turn to like our favorite podcasts or our pundits. Right? And I'm not saying there's anything bad about that. In fact, I'm actually saying the opposite. Because in some sense, while the last few years may have caused us to, to distance ourselves from Scripture at a certain level, and maybe this, doesn't, this part doesn't apply to you, but I think I've seen enough of this to say that, okay, maybe you've distanced yourself from Scripture in some sense, but you've picked up these other voices. And there's plenty of people who would be like, you've, you've replaced the voice of Scripture with the voice of culture. And I'm like, well, maybe... We've been, I said we're being readied for something. Maybe we've been ready to be more thoughtful interpreters of Scripture now. Because back then when you had this fondness for Scripture, it was in such an insular context that you weren't really thinking about how this text really applied to those that didn't share your worldview or those that didn't have your categories. And, and maybe if you did, you just saw them as like believer, non-believer. I'm the asset, they're the one in need, I need to bring this to them, and that, that's as far as you went. But now maybe, because of whatever has happened in life, whatever seasons have come, and whatever other voices you listen to, maybe it's actually, instead of ruining you for Scripture, maybe it's actually readying you for a revisiting of Scripture, because now you're more thoughtful than you used to be. And now that you're more, con you're more conscious than you used to be. I think Vinay, I don't know where Vinay is, I saw him this morning. Vinay is such a, a good example of this. Um, I, Vinay said this to me, we were having this conversation rec recently, and Vinay is like, he has a desire to plant churches, right? And he's, the great thing about his desire is he put deadlines to his desire. So he's not just a dreamer, he's a doer as well. Um, and he's very honest with saying, the church that I would have planted two years ago is very different than the one that I seek to plant in the next two years. Because he's had this journey, in some sense, he's had to distance himself from a certain way of thinking and allow other voices into his life, which have actually now prepared him and given him a better lens for revisiting Scripture. And so now his devotion to the Apostles' teaching is far, more, is far closer to the Apostles' teaching than whatever oppressive version of that teaching that we may have experienced in a former era of our Christian walk. But there is a warning for us here, because if you have gotten to a place, if we've gotten to a place where we want to distance ourselves from uh, Scripture and how it can become in the hands of those who weaponize it an oppressive authority, and we want to run from that, and I get that, we have to be careful that we don't run so far that we forget that it is also a good, trustworthy authority. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching for, for not just the gospel, but the scriptures that are creating health and growth in that early community. And what else? What else? If you look in verses 43 and following, I'm just going to mention a couple things. They were also devoted to, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, prayers, right? This, this shared way of life. It's a word I've used a lot. I think people have noticed that it's something I value for our church. It's connection. Right? There's, there's, um, after experiencing all this stuff that they were experiencing, the easiest thing would be like, how can we make it happen again? And yet where the Spirit led them to is like, okay, we have all of these people. And Vanita asked the question, you know, I mentioned it last week, uh, she heard someone praying, Lord, bring more people, bring more people. Okay, when they come, what will we do with them? And so in many ways, this is probably what point care looks like in the first century. What will we do with them? We will connect them with one another. And I think, if I can have this backdrop of the pandemic again, I think we probably had permission 
to disconnect. And what I mean by permission is, I think there are serv- I think there were people all along who wanted to disconnect from the church. Frankly, for illegitimate and legitimate reasons. But we just never had the social permission to do that. And then 2019, 20, and 21 came, and now not only do we have the social permission to do that, we have the advice that you must do that. And so a disconnect became a de-church, and for some people it became a deconstruct, and it's even become a deny. And we have to be able to respect the power of that, uh, to not just say that like, we're going to perpetually stay in this place of, of disconnect and de-church. And again, this might be another place where we say, yeah, see, we never came back, and now we're worse off. Or maybe similar to how distance from Scripture for a time prepared us to be more thoughtful interpreters of Scripture now, maybe disconnecting and in some sense de-churching for a time has prepared us to have more empathetic and overlap connection now. Maybe some of our hard and fast either-or categories that we had before, we just live in a world that just doesn't work anymore. It just doesn't fit in so many places. That we disconnected from here, but we connected over here. And yeah, maybe we connected with, with um, people groups that we never would have connected with before, but maybe that was the problem, is that we had cultivated this culture and way of life as church that kept us from meaningful connection outside of the church. And now we have connected outside of the church, but maybe that's not where we should stop. Maybe we should say, now that we have more empathetic and intentional connection outside of the church, maybe that's actually going to enable us to be better connected within the context of the church, our church. Maybe it makes for more a thoughtful commitment to not only devoting ourselves to doctrine, right, scary word, oppressive word, teaching, let's say, but maybe it's preparing us for a more thoughtful commitment to Scripture through a shared life in a community. Right? And I've seen that, right? I mentioned I saw Vinay and how he's changed in his approach to Scripture and what it'll mean for his ministry one day. But um, I've seen this happen with people that are very, very dear to me. I've seen people who... Who have, who have committed to being a member of our community and not just a member of our community, but like contributing to our community over the last 10 weeks in ways that I've not seen in 10 years. And they're, and they're, and they're better now because I knew them then and I loved them then, but I know them now and I love them now and they're better now than they were then. Even if they don't think it, I see it. Because now maybe they're rediscovering what life in the text looks like. And they're rediscovering what life in a Christian community looks like. But I tell you, they're doing it with so much more thoughtfulness, so much more empathy, and so much more awareness of self and others and who we're supposed to be in God's world. And we see this shared life continuing. Um, It says they had all things in common. Selling, distributing, they lived Uh, in the temple together, in homes daily, daily, daily. And so not just a devotion to Scripture, not just a devotion to connected, shared life, but but a devotion to being a generous and a hospitable people. Um, Here, let me just share a little bit of a personal story. So Anne and I, um, I would say we used to have a revolving door in our house. And it became very, very, it was great. There was a real season where it was great. We still have videos of like small groups. We used to call them something else in a previous version of life. But um, we still have videos of what it was like. And, and there's some people in this room that are part of those videos. And there's children of people in this room that were part of those videos. Um, Trish is in those videos. Claire is in those videos. Um, Liz and Charlie are in those videos. Um, and it was a really, really, uh, 
I got a little glimpse into it recently because there would be times where we would be out of our house. Ann and I are driving in Princeton and we'd get a call. Maybe it was from Phil. We'd get a call and be like, hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, we're just in Princeton. We're on our way back home. Where are you? And Phil would be like, in your living room. Um, and that's in some ways the kind of like revolving door shared life we had. I think Roger gave us a version of that recently where we had CG at our house a couple of weeks ago. And he was like, hey, uh, we just walked in. We weren't there yet, right? It's great. Um, that in some sense ran amok far too much in our life in a previous season because it became difficult to tell where community began and then where the Adhikari family began. And so in some sense, while we had this life and this shared identity with others, we really didn't have a shared identity with ourselves. Anne and I became good co-laborers in the gospel and then very, little more than roommates with each other. And so what you need when you overextend that way is you respond with boundaries, right? You need boundaries. And some of us over the last several years within the context of Christian experience have discovered this wonderful thing that we never exist, that we never knew existed, which are boundaries. And some of us might have viewed boundaries as an end in itself. Like we have boundaries and those boundaries are not just like things that enable us to go in and go out. Their boundaries have turned into like things that give us permission to stay away, period, the end forever. And our boundaries, in some sense, have given us a life where it's, it's become like bomb shelters and, 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 and our, lives have be, our life has become like a, a bunker mentality. Where in some sense, like the world, as hard as it is, and it is hard, and, and it is cold, and it can be dark, um, it's become a place where we have sheltered ourselves from that world rather than allowing these boundaries to create in us a level of health that enable us to return to this world and return to a shared life together. And not just with our homes, right? There is a sensible, there's a sensibility, there's a sense and sensibility to the boundaries, but I think we've gone from being sensible in some sense to being stingy. And not just with homes, right? And I'm going to let you guys figure out what that looks like in your own homes. I don't want to legislate. I want, oh, Adhikari said, uh, everyone's going to be having everyone over all the time. No, that's not what I'm saying. Um, but there is this sense in which we become, in some sense, maybe, maybe we become not just overly boundaried in our homes, but overly stingy with the resources that God has given us as well. And this is like, right, this is one of the scariest things to talk about when you're in this position, right? Like some churches talk about money all the time. Some churches talk about money never. And we probably veer towards the never. But I don't think this would be a category for the early church, this group of people. I don't think this would have been health and growth for them to be able to say, to normalize uh, this kind of era that we're in where churches right now, the biggest thing that they struggle with from an issue of being generous to the communities around them is that the biggest demographic in the church financially are regular attendees who are non-givers. Right? Um, and I can even hear the objection to that. Well, it's like, okay, fine, we won't be regular attendees then. Right? And if you hear that cynical voice, then you might say something like that. But ask yourself, is that a place where we should land? That is a place where the American church in all of its various tribes has landed. Is that a place we should land if we want to live this virtue of health and growth. So what has this looked like, right? What are we being readied for, right? Are we being readied for, oof, are we being readied for something like this? Are we being readied for something like this, right? What, what are we being readied for? I'm gonna get there in a second, but when I say something like multiplication, I wonder sometimes if people like in their minds envision like some sort of like startup incubator. Like that's what I'm calling us to be. A place where it looks like, you know, if you've ever watched the movie like The Social Network or movies like that, like is that what PCC is supposed to be? Well, I would love it if it was. That's great. That scratches a certain itch of mine. But I think one of the ways that health and growth 
this multiplication mindset, us being a faithful and fruitful people, we've actually been seeing this in our community, and I don't want to miss this. These are two places that it has shown up recently. This is Vanita leading us in Point Care 201 last week, and this is uh, Dennis and Donna hosting um, community group hosting the um, community group at their house on Wednesday. Right, and, and, and Vanita leading us is not just Vanita up there speaking, right? So Vanita's modeling what health and growth looks like. No, she's not just doing that. She's giving us uh, categories for thinking about how we can increase in being a healthy and growing community. Categories she's giving us, three wonderful categories. Case studies, um, and mo- most, most of all, she's giving us a collaborative spirit to be able to enjoy that together. Right? I looked at that, that was my favorite picture, like just people with raised hands and all that. They're not worshiping, they're actually just um, participating. And then what it looks like here, um, this past Wednesday night, among other things, is, so this is the Pirello CG, except the Pirellos are in Hong, um, Macau right now, right? So they're in Asia. And so what we see is people devoting themselves to to prayer and devoting themselves to the study of scripture and they're probing the text and we're probing each other it sounds horrible probing each other we're we're pushing each other (laughs) we're we're pushing each other as we probe the text um and so i spent a lot of time with teenagers so you really have to watch what you say um right and we're sharing food and life right like amen donna strawberry cake for anyone who had it i didn't um but, but the, the health and the growth there is, um, and not to put them on the spot, but Dennis and Donna have been here now for two years, and they've been present, right? Um, and they weren't part of, their, of, a, of, a, of a CG. But guess what? Tony and Ming, and I'm going to single out Tony here because he's the one I've heard it from the most. Tony has this deep, deep concern for his neighbors, right? Dennis and Donna to the left, Carlos on the right. And he's not just like, oh, I have this concern. He's throwing ideas at me. Oh, I want to do this alpha course with them and, and you know, cover basic Christian doctrine. And I want to be able to do this and do this. But at the very least, what it landed in, the multiplication that it resulted in, is Dennis and Donna, while Tony and Minger and Macau saying, you know what? Like, we don't want to just wait until they come back. Let us host. So we'll host. And we'll not just host. We'll, we'll engage And we'll participate, and we won't just engage and participate. We have Donna, like, hitting me up and being like, where's that study Bible I asked for? And um, very graciously, she wouldn't say it like that. Um, And and I can't wait till you do that class in January on how to study and interpret Scripture. Right? So it's, it's, it's this growth that's happening, and it's this growth that hopefully it goes from, it will, from Vanita in these categories to a people, to a care team. And so, yeah, 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 Pentecost, sure, sure, sure. Like, there's, there's the, the intimidation of what health and growth requires of us, what faithful and fruitful, what multiplication requires for us is, do we need to engineer another Pentecost? No. We couldn't if we tried. Do we need to summon 3,000 to come to life? I would love to. I should not have such power. But, so I get why we would be intimidated by that. I think the reflection for us is, why would we be intimidated of the life in these five verses that looks like this? Why would we not say, you know, we've come back from the pandemic, and yeah, in some ways we're really, really different, but we're also better in some sense. We just need to keep moving and reconnected to the old thing, because there's so much power and not, it's not about whether or not we're going to do the old thing again or whether or not we're going to do a new thing, maybe it's about doing the old thing in a new way. And maybe that's what God has been moving us towards over these last few years. So maybe we, it's not whether we've come back or haven't come back, but it's being, we're being readied for something. And we're so close to watching that happen. And so let's just keeping, keep moving that one step more, one step more, as, as we are already seeing people doing here. Um, I got a lot of thoughts. I got a lot more questions. But... Um, the one I'd probably end with is, I get why we'd be scared of cross-cultural evangelism like Pentecost. 
and open-air preaching like Peter. What scares us about making increasing moves towards shared life like this? That would be my question for everyone here, but I want to hear what your questions are for me before we go to the table. So Marv's got the mic. You got hands. Curtis. Uh, when I look at this verse, th this is a little bit of a different emphasis, Pro Tim. But I don't want us to ignore the outward focus that was Peter's sermon. And I think it's said, what, verse 43. Well, well, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where everyone's filled with awe at many wonders and signs yeah. that also were largely outward. So mm -hmm. certainly there is an amazing growth mm -hmm. and fruitfulness that is inward focusing. Yeah. But I don't want us to also forget that there is a substantial outward focus Amen. in this passage as well. Amen. I'm going to reconnect back to that as we head to the table. Thank you very much, for Curtis. Sorry, I just, in the moment, I was like, oh my gosh, you're going to steal my ending. But that's like, <laughs> who cares, right? Like, that's so dumb. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I highlighted that verse myself. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders mm -hmm. and signs were being done through the apostles. And I was talking to William. I said, William, have you ever had a, a, a time where you really felt that it was the Holy Spirit leading you to do something? Mm -hmm. Like where you really knew, because it's not like we walk around going. And, you know, I was able to even share with him how um, I had a situation. Somebody at work, their um, daughter was having a baby. Mm. And just felt it really impressed upon my heart strongly to make a hat for this baby, to crochet a hat. Mm. And I haven't really been crocheting lately, and I, but it was so strong. And I made one hat, I'm like, I love that yarn, I'm making that hat, and I made, next thing you know, I'm making a bucket hat, I'm making mm. another. And it just, but it was so, this person wasn't always like a person that you would give something mm. to mm. in the way that she treated me, but I just had, so much love in giving her this mm. box and, and, and put it in a pretty box and just gave it to her with love. And I knew that that was the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And whatever, I had a chance to show her the love of God. Yeah. And I know that was the Holy Spirit and I felt it strongly. And yeah. So the Lord does lead us and work is a ministry as well. Yeah, I, I love that. In many ways, you could state it simply, what health and growth looks like is responsiveness to the Spirit. And we so oftentimes over edit and filter ourselves like, oh, that's just me or that's just last night's Mexican food or what, whatever it is. That's like, you know, um, I have nothing against Mexican food. I just pick whatever cuisine you want. But but I think we got to remove the word just right. It is your mind. It is your heart. And that happens to be the vessel that the spirit is speaking to and through right now. Um, so don't over edit what he's doing. We have to assume that God is working and then where can we align to that? So I love you calling us to that. Pastor, I see a hand over here. I got the mic. Yep. So that, see that hand? I'm sorry. One per family. One per family. <laughs> That's one not family. right. <laughs> we have a one family. I'm just kidding. You could have. But, but we might run out of time now. So blame Howie, you know. <laughs> Real quick, um, I think about, as you was, as you was teaching us today, mm -hmm. um, where we were before the, before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'm very, I'm into tech, y'all, if y'all don't know that. Yeah. And so I'm looking at where we are now with, say, AI mm -hmm. being, being present. And I find myself looking at things where before AI, I would just wait on the Holy Spirit. I wait for mm. all of that to happen. I find myself now going to AI a little bit more often. However, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit brings me back to a word that's in the Bible or, mm -hmm. or whatever to get me grounded. And I think we have to be careful of that also, that the AI is not going to replace the Holy Spirit. Sure. But it's only because we, I had that time during the pandemic mm -hmm. to study the word that I'm able now to say, OK, I could go to AI for some information. Mm -hmm. But what I'm looking for, I need to make sure that it's linked to 
to the word of God. I yeah. hope that makes sense. No, yeah. Rebecca? Yeah. Sorry, William, she beat you. I mean. What about me? What about you? <laughs> now, we'll end. But, I mean, look, it's not enough that you're on the screen. That ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, so. Um, I, I don't know how to, I don't know if it's a question, but it's just something that I've been struggling with and I felt like today you addressed so many things that's really um, just important to me and, and that I felt and really, I just didn't know how to put into words. But um, I think I'm at a place where, you know, during the pandemic, we didn't go to church for a few years and sure. it all of a sudden freed up this time that we invested in our community. And mm -hmm. in a, like in the way that God has given to us, and it's hard not to look at church now as um, something that would take away our time and resources. Mm -hmm. You know, because I feel like we're all so busy, and we all have so many things that's pulling us. And you know, we're our kids are still, you know, on the younger side, and so we're very finite being. And so, you know, I, but what draws me to wanting to find a church is that I, I'm, I have that deep sense of needing to connect and to, mm -hmm. to, to grow in a deeper way. And what you said about scripture is so spot on for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how to marry the two, you mm -hmm. know? I don't know how to not live my life where, um, because I see it now. I see like the way that I was living and the way that I was committed to the church, it, it, it kind of blinded, even though we were doing a lot of community stuff, yeah. but I wasn't engaged in the community the way that I am now. Sure. And, and that came from because all my needs before were met in the church, yeah. right? And then church was gone, and then I have this need to connect with people. And so I connected with my community in a different way yeah. and so that to me is still beautiful and good yeah but i don't know what church means now yeah. and i think a lot of it is also because of the distance you know somerset is not far from us at all yeah. 10 minutes but it's farther you know than just in our town sure so i think that's i don't know if anybody else kind of relate to that but mm -hmm. i don't know what church looks like for me I don't know where it sits on my priority, but mm -hmm. I have a deep longing for that depth of connection that I, maybe I haven't found yet mm -hmm. in my community, but I definitely see them differently and I, yeah. I live differently. I think that, I feel like I saw so many heads not kept. Was, oh, I thought Kev was gonna grab the mic, I got excited. Um, <laughs> I was like, maybe we can expect miracles now. Um, I think that, um, that question is in many ways what like this sermon is meant for, which is, I think the first thing that's really, really necessary is that you care. Because I think there are people who have gotten to that place who, um, who have just written off the category of church altogether. And I know, listen, I was talking to whomever this morning, I don't remember who it was, like, I go through that on a weekly, no, daily basis of like, what does it mean for me to even you know, and so one, I think that just caring matters. I think the second thing is I, I wonder if we, when we think of getting involved with church, I wonder if sometimes we think about it in terms of how we used to be involved with it, which is like, oh my gosh, you got to be at the buildings, you know, nine nights a week. And that's what it means to be connected to the church. And for me, for us, it's really like, you know, we do this twice a, twice a month with the Pirellos. Um, you know, Ann and I host one at our house. We go to the, the Candithils. We're grabbing Moe's with them after this. You guys have had lunch with several people, with Marv and whatever. And so some ways, it's already happening, uh, which is not to say that, like, oh, this is so far from me. It's already happening. You're a wonderful connector of people. And then to ask, like, okay, not, like, what's the next, like, 10-step leap, but like what's one step that is sustainable? I think about this in terms of money too, because people are like, you know, times are so tough and the price of, you know, eggs is uh, a gold brick. Um, and so, but then when they look at their lives a little bit where it's just like, can we not, um, I wonder to some extent if we can't sometimes reevaluate, like we actually have, 
more time than we think, and this isn't as onerous as people think. I wonder if that's the reality, right? Because when I think about what it means for me to live a shared life with people at PCC, it's probably like an additional, not even additional, it's probably like I'm talking about three or four spaces a month where I connect with people, right? And then I just, I'd get together with Jelani anyway, right? Like I'd call Claire anyway. And so for me, it's more of just like, can we, are we saying we can't make room for a once or twice a month connection to just try sharing life and see where that goes and see if that doesn't open up new levels of inspiration, awakening for us. So in some sense, it's not like cut off all the wonderful stuff that y'all are doing with North Brunswick and Buddy. Absolutely not. Um, may God not lead us there. It's more of like, can we be open to the one place we may be scared of, which is a once a month thing of that. Um, and to be honest with the fact that, yeah, maybe we are scared and apprehensive to do that because we think if we do that, then we'll do this and this and this, and then I'll go back to where I was and I don't want to go back to where I was. Sorry, I'm rambling right now, but um, I think the thing for us is looking at what we have and what's the one thing that we can add um, that's missing is, is probably what I'd say. Sorry, that wasn't very linear, but um, here's why I think it matters. William, did you have, what was it? I, I, no, 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 what is it? Listen, listen, you guys have had a rough couple of days as Yankee fans, so I'm going to give you, I want to give you, <laughs> I want to, I want to give you the mic. You're close to playing golf with the Mets now, yeah. Yeah, and keep in mind in verse 46, it says that they weren't just breaking bread in their homes, they were attending the temple together. So the temple would have been the big gathering, right? So the thing we call this right now. Um, no, thank you for, for stamping that. Here's where I want to end as we go to the table. And it's kind of where Curtis was leading us to. I've been saying that like we've been readying for something. What have we been uh, ready for, right? And they devoted themselves, they readied themselves. Um, I think it is something like verse 43, for all to come upon every soul and many wonders and signs to be done through the apostles. Um, and here's the end, right? Verse 47, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Right? The responsiveness of this community was one of health and the Lord saw fit to add growth. Um, he's the great multiplier in some sense. But here's what a life like this is helping us to do. This is where I said taking risks to move towards safety. I'm going to just share, share a little anecdote as we close. Um, I had lived an experience when I was doing ministry down at Princeton that I thought was really, really fruitful. However, I never got to do the next stage of what I wanted to do. And, and it ended. And I was left thinking, what the heck did you do, God? Like, why did you bring me here? Why did you stop what you were doing with me on Wall Street and bring me here through seminary on this case? Like, why, why, why? Um, and it took me about a year of therapy. It took me uh, a year of um, disconnect with my family to be able to realize that I may not have been safe to bless to the next level. God is the great multiplier, but we as a people must become a place that is safe for him to bless. And I think what this life is, this life that we have to take risks to step into little by little, bit by bit, is a life that where we're saying to God is, God, we want to move towards health. We want to move towards your growth. We want to be faithful. We want to be fruitful. 
We want you to multiply. And we are, because of that, we want to make sure that we are becoming increasingly safe to bless. And so our virtue, sustaining health and growth, is not then a move away from safety. It's actually a move towards safety. It is taking risks to move towards being a place that is increasingly safe to bless and multiply. So as we come to the table, come with kind of these prayers in mind or add whatever version of this suits you and how the Lord is leading you. Come to the table where Jesus uh, has modeled uh, this life. He has modeled what it means uh, to be uh, generous and hospitable and to create connections all according to the scriptures. And as you come to the broken body of Jesus, symbolized by the bread, ask him, Lord, please um, dismantle our, maybe it's idolatry, maybe it's deal with our fears. Lord, would you do that as you come to this table? And then as you come to the cup, Lord, would you please not just uh, dis dis disable our di um, idolatry and deal with our fear, would you display your life through us? Would you sustain health and growth through us? Would you make us safe to bless and then bless us? So as you come to the table, come with that in mind um, and come when you are ready. If you are not someone who is identified with Jesus, um, this table is meant for you to, to identify with Jesus for the first time. If you have been in a place where you have steps you need to make with the Lord, it's for you. If you're someone that feels like, Lord, thank you so much for the, the health and the growth I have experienced, would you do more in me and in us? Wherever you are at, this table is meant for you, so come when you're ready. Let me pray. Father, um, thank you for the model we have in Jesus. Thank you for the model we have in this early community. Help, please, make us a people who are safe to bless. Please encourage us, inspire us, Use us in the lives of one another, and yes, as Curtis has said, uh, use us in the lives uh, of others to extend blessing not only to us, uh, but then through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Come when you're ready.